Welcome to the Data Science Seminar. It's my great pleasure to welcome our speaker today, Jenja Jitzev from Jülich Supercomputing Center. Jenja Jitzev. A warm welcome also to Ralf Floka, who will take over the introduction. Oh, thank you very much for the kind words, uh, Doreen, and great to have you here, Jenja. Um, Jenja comes from the uh, Research Center Ulic and working there in the Division of Federated Systems and Data, heading the uh, group of cross-sectional uh, deep learning. And uh, our first uh, encounter we both had, for example, was for a project pitch uh, in last year summer uh, for the pandemic pandemic in, in, in Helmholtz. Uh, it, it sadly did not work out with the pitch, but uh, it was very interesting uh, to, to work with Janja and we see a lot of synergy and potential as he's working on very interesting topics in the context of maybe unsupervised learning, generative models, also things like one-shot learning or uh, transfer learning, how to make it most efficiently if you want to uh, conduct and apply research in, in uh, adaptive multi-layer neural networks. And so we, we directly had the feeling there's a lot of music in, into it and synergies between uh, the work he does and things that are done, for example, in the German Research Center, uh, which is more applied. So I'm very happy that we could arrange then uh, also a presentation of yours and I'm really looking forward to. And so without further ado, I leave the stage now <laughs> because I'm curious what you have to show. Uh, thank you very much for being here, Janja. Okay, thanks a lot for kind of introduction. Yeah, I cannot I promise to play any music, um, but <laughs> uh, I would like to share the screen. This is okay now, right? So let's see. Yes, that works. That hopefully works. Fine. Okay, so uh, hello, welcome everybody. Thanks a lot for inviting me and for joining in for this talk. Uh, in the talk, I would like to uh, elaborate on uh, systematic improvements um, that pre-training of large network models and large data sets may generate um, if transferring those large pre-trained models across uh, different and um, eventually domain-specific data sets of much smaller size than those used uh, during large-scale pre-training. Um, and before we turn to transfer learning, a few remarks about the non-transferable learning, uh, which was and still um, um, arguably is quite a large fraction um, of machine learning um, uh, studied and exercised in practice. Um, there we have as depicted here for distinct data sets um, uh, that may belong to different domains, D1, D2, and D3. Uh, with corresponding tasks to solve T1, T2, and T3, um, each a separate model, M1, M2, and M3 being trained on respective data set tasks from scratch, providing then solutions um, only in the frame of a particular scenario the training was carried out in. So the strong assumption uh, reassuring here model quality on unseen data is that training and tests are coming from uh, roughly the same data distribution. This limits uh, model reuse across distinct data sets strongly, so that for each new data set and task, an entirely new model has to be uh, then trained from scratch again, which is of course uh, resource consuming and slow, especially for deep learning where data has to be large enough to obtain a model of a decent quality. So even more importantly for those cases where you have only few data available for training, there is often just no way to train a good model from data when it's scarce, right? Um, and here where the transfer learning enters the stage and puts forward methods that allow to pre-train uh, one model um, on a particular large, rather generic data set or collection of those such that the pre-trained model can be then taken as a blueprint and used for efficient transfer to a broad range of different downstream data set and tasks. Efficient means that it can be better on the downstream data set and task if compared to training the same model there from scratch without pre-training, better uh, being in terms of faster learning uh, convergence or in terms of data efficiency requiring less data to train or just having better final performance uh, than training from scratch would deliver. So importantly, those methods allow to reuse model um, representations obtained during pre-training in such a way uh, that it becomes possible to train a good model even for those problems where available data is scarce. Um, um, 
So classical transfer learning uh, is still though a restricted set and like a restricted frame, restricted setting. Um, as for each target domain, you end up with different models depicted here with M12, M13, originating from the common pre-trained model M1, uh, following retraining or fine tuning. And those models do only care about performance on their respective uh, target setting. Um, ideally, and this is what arguably everyone in machine learning community is dreaming of, um, one would like to have this kind of universal learner which digests incoming data sets and continually updates one single unified generic model that is also able to cope with those new incoming data sets and tasks in an efficient manner without losing the ability to perform well on all the tasks seen before. So one single model for all and um, sure enough, it's known in the community how hard it is to get to a learning a system like this. So right now, this way more simple post transfer learning is able to provide some initial um, in segments of long shaking bridge towards that kind of a generic self-organizing and transferable learning. So let's have a look on the usual transfer methodology employed in deep learning nowadays. Um, the usual scenario is uh, we have two domains, the source and the target. So pre-training is done first on the large uh, generic source data set D1, like for instance, ImageNet. Network M1 is randomly initialized for pre-training. So training done from scratch and source data set being large makes this procedure slow. Um, so the pre-trained model M1 is then taken to be uh, retrained or fine-tuned um, on a usually smaller data set D2, uh, which can be a much faster procedure, not only due to a smaller data set size, but also sometimes due to using only a small fraction of parameters as compared to the whole pre-trained network. For instance, in extreme case, when freezing all of it and just fine tuning topmost linear classification layer of the network. Um, or when using a few shot transfer methods where only a few examples per class are provided during transfer. So this fine tuned network model can be then compared in terms of different performance aspects on transfer to a network uh, that is trained from scratch uh, directly on the target data set. Um, so in the pre-training phase, um, which uh, can be understood just as a training in conventional sense, we can on the one hand um, execute different forms of learning that rely either on a labeled source uh, data set like still most widespread supervised case or using a fraction of labels while dealing with um, large unlabeled parts uh, like in semi-supervised case or entirely working um, without external labels by doing uh, unsupervised learning that can again have different forms, for instance, self-supervised web pseudo labels can be generated automatically from the available source data. And this um, different learning forms can be used either within a standard uh, single level optimization, which is still most often the case, or they can be also part of a bi-level optimization scheme with inner and outer optimization loops, for instance, like in case of meta learning approaches to transfer. So once pre-trained, the network a model with pre-trained weights uh, is exposed to a target data set um, and task where fine tuning is performed. Uh, for the fine tuning, uh, there are gradations to which extent the network stays trainable. So it can be anything in between freezing the whole network and training only final task specific layer on the top of it. For instance, uh, linear classification had, um, or as another extreme doing full fine tuning involving all the network weights. Um, when doing fine tuning, Hyperparameters uh, like learning rate schedules and such are usually different from pre-training um, and target data is often smaller than the pre-training data source. And in so-called few shot transfer, in addition, there is only a few number of examples uh, on the few per class and supervised case um, that is shown during fine tuning uh, for transfer. For fine tuning um, pre-trained model, we just run the usual gradient descent optimization based on loss uh, defined on target task starting from pre-trained weights uh, indicated here with theta, a part of which may be frozen and not subject to further change. Um, so fine-tuning a pre-trained model during transfer is conceptually just training in usual sense. Um, we just start not from random initialized weights, but from pre-trained ones. So this is the overall methodology uh, for transfer learning uh, here an example where source is something like ImageNet and target uh, data sets uh, can be um, X-ray chest, medical imaging, where tasks can be in both uh, cases classification. And we're interested in whether the model pre-trained on source gives us any benefits on target task if compared 
to the same model randomly initialized and trained on target data set directly from scratch. So transfer learning of this kind was applied already uh, in the very early days when deep neural networks were rising using architectures like overfeed or VGG dating all the way back to 2013-14. Uh, so those networks were pre-trained an image net and then taking as off-the-shelf generic feature reservoirs that could be reused in multitude of different downstream tasks, mostly by freezing the whole network and uh, retraining on its top, for example, a simple linear support vector machine classifier. Um, and it turned out that across all different tasks, those transferred pre-trained generic models were as good or even better than specialized state-of-the-art back then uh, solutions depicted here in violet color in the bus uh, that were based on carefully hand engineered processing pipelines and features as in strong contrast to off the shelf generic convolutional network uh, obtained by learning from uh, image data. Okay, so since then, uh, as all the non deep learning based methods were wiped out um, from the field, uh, transfer learning performance is no longer assessed by comparing deep nets to other methods, but by comparing deep nets to themselves to the, the trained from scratch versions. Um, and there are networks like uh, ResNet uh, 50 that serve very often as a standalone standard backbone architecture for pre-training a model for transfer. Um, meanwhile, there is plenty of other choices for a network model backbone uh, for pre-training, uh, like for instance, more recent efficient net variants as shown on the right here. Uh, and this choice is usually driven by the performance uh, networks show on standard image net training and by its computational cost. Um, so for systematically evaluating transfer performance, there are benchmark data sets for transfer learning that span a variety of domains, like for instance, um, uh, visual task adaptation benchmark here, VTAB, that contains different data sets that also belong uh, to standards in machine vision like Cypher 10 or 100. Uh, also subdividing uh, the domains uh, here into three groups, uh, natural, uh, specialized, and structured, loosely corresponding to a uh, domain type. With such um, transfer learning benchmarking data sets, it becomes then possible to make somewhat uh, systematic evaluation and compare transfer learning across different conditions, um, like for instance, uh, shown here. Um, where VTAB is used to check average performance uh, on each of those different domain groups uh, when either doing um, supervised training uh, from scratch directly on target data set or using transfer learning with different types of pre-training um, as indicated here. Um, um, so this provides here some evidence that transfer learning with either supervised, semi-supervised uh, or unsupervised pre-trained model and fully uh, fine-tuned then on the target outperforms, especially on a natural domain, supervised training from scratch in both low and high data regime, where either a fraction of thousand here or all available samples are used um, uh, during transfer. So here another work that takes object detection and semantic segmentation tasks to test transfer learning benefits, using again uh, a vast collection of different data sets as targets, and here, one special move is that instead of pre-training on um, ImageNet only, like it is usually done, each of those data sets can also serve as a source uh, for pre-training uh, with the rest being targets for transfer. And in this way, one can also assess differences and transfer learning when using different source data for pre-training. Um, so in this score matrix, we see then uh, the model performance after transfer on each um, data set when using different source data sets for pre-training relative to the transfer learning performance with model pre-trained on ImageNet. So in some cases we see that pre-training with a different source can be better than pre-training on ImageNet as indicated here in green. Um, and in some cases it can be worse uh, indicated here in red. But what is uh, very clearly seen then uh, in the rightmost column uh, that uh, training from scratch without any pre-training without any transfer directly on target data sets is always worse than doing transfer learning um, with an ImageNet pre-trained model. So again, evidence states that it's worth doing pre-training and transfer instead of just uh, training from scratch. And this uh, evidence though uh, we saw comes from uh, scenarios where source data and target data 
are still somewhat of similar kind, being uh, similarly distributed of similar domain. Uh, what is about the cases where a target is quite different from source? Like here, in the depicted case of pre-training on natural images, uh, ImageNet, again, and transferring to different uh, medical uh, imaging data sets. And so this work here, for instance, compared um, performance on medical imaging data sets like Retina and Chexpert by either training there from scratch or by taking ImageNet pre-trained model for transfer. Um, uh, so, and there we see um, for Retina, it shows no benefit for transfer for any of the uh, studied networks and actually also indicates that smaller networks like mentioned here with uh, CBR can be almost uh, as good as their larger counterparts when uh, trained from scratch. Uh, for Chexpert data set across different classification tasks, there is like mixed results, but also seemingly no clear um, um, significant benefit for transfer learning as compared to training from scratch. And CBR, smaller networks, again, seem to perform on par with larger ones. Um, yet another study had a look on Chexpert as a transfer target while pre-training on ImageNet. And here, when looking on average performance across uh, uh, many different network architectures are used as backbone during pre-training, there is some evidence for better performance when using transfer learning uh, compared to training from scratch again. However, its significancy, well, it's quite modest, small, right? Um, so while this gives quite inconclusive overall picture, there is often one interesting point that uh, reoccurs in such studies, but is often overlooked, which is while often where no clear benefits can be found in full data regime during transfer, using only small fraction of data creates interesting phenomena uh, showing significant improvement for uh, transfer learning uh, but only when taking larger network models like seen here for ResNet 50 opposed to smaller CBR networks when transferring only a small fraction of Retina uh, data set uh, using 5,000 samples than we saw before. So and there is the point where we have to talk explicitly about model and data size used during pre-training. Um, common characteristic of transfer learning studies uh, we saw is that the largest source data set they usually use is ImageNet 1K with about 1.4 million images inside and utilize network models like ResNets are mostly of modest size. And this is in strong contrast to what happens for instance in language modeling where very large transformer networks um, are trained in source self-supervised manner as autoregressive generative models on a very large data set of text. So between language and vision domains, there are three, four orders of magnitude in model and data size used during pre-training, a big difference that is in addition to difference between supervised and um, unsupervised scheme utilized for learning. So some concrete numbers here for contrast, large uh, language models like GPT-3 family may contain billions or even hundred billions or meanwhile trillions actually of parameters, uh, while still recently, well, still dominant convolutional architectures, although transformers are also coming there for vision, have around a few hundred millions weights or even less like here in case of efficient net. Uh, and while ImageNet 1K uh, that is still widely used for pre-training and transfer has around this uh, 1.4 million image samples, the text corpora used for language modeling contain tens of billions of text sentences. Keeping in mind this strong contrast that still exists between language and vision domains um, in model and data size used for training, we may question whether differences observed in performance uh, also in transfer learning may have to do something with it. Um, so, and there is a large number of works coming out from language modeling that provides very strong evidence um, as presented here as one example, that model size is very strong influence on transfer performance observed, especially when performing uh, this kind of uh, zero or few short transfer in very low data regime. So here we see that there is a huge difference in accuracy measured on transfer language uh, modeling task after self-supervised pre-training of different sized uh, GPT models uh, with performance strongly increasing when uh, increasing uh, model size. So in general, um, this line of works from language modeling suggests that there is strong improvement of model capability to generalize as measured in decrease of loss on a test data set when uh, increasing model size or data size during training. 
Um, as shown here on the plot on the left, uh, steady reduction in pest loss is possible when increasing a model size, however, only uh, when provided with a data set large enough. And similar phenomena emerges um, when increasing data set size here on the right, pest loss decreases steadily only when using a large enough uh, model size uh, for training. And it becomes here clear that you lose a lot of potential uh, test loss performance um, when limiting yourself with either too small model uh, or uh, too small data in the pre-training. Here on the right, um, also some evidence provided that along with generalization, transfer performance improves as well when uh, continuously increasing model size, um, if fine tuning then on different uh, target uh, data sets. So when measuring test loss systematically across different size conditions during training, like shown here, um, there seems to be quite a generic story that posits scaling laws of power law form uh, for test loss, depending on compute time uh, invested during training, data size, and model size. Uh, it showed that increasing all of them hand in hand without creating bottlenecks in either of those will result in steady improvement of generalization ability holding across uh, many orders of magnitude with test loss going further down without any hints for saturation. Um, so given sufficient compute budget, uh, increasing both model size and data size is the way to strongly boost generalization, which also explains tremendous success of such huge pre-trained language models like GPT-3 when transferring on very different downstream uh, target data sets. And as shown on the plot below, this generalization boost relies mostly on increasing model size, followed by an increase uh, in data size for training, which looks the modest in comparison to a necessary substantial increase in the model capacity if we're aiming to further decrease the test loss and boost generalization. So now, according to conventional view um, in machine learning theory, uh, increasing model size further and further was always considered to be a very bad idea, uh, leading to overfitting, poor generalization, and high error on the test set. Since recently, this conventional view, uh, though, has been uh, radically revised, indicating that error on the test set has a behavior described by this kind of a double descent curve. In this revised view, increasing model size further and further leads to a transition in test error behavior such that with ever increasing the model size, test error goes further and further down in the so-called overparametrized regime after passing uh, interpolation threshold where training error drops to zero and stays there. So according to this view, um, making model larger and larger should make generalization stronger and stronger. So such double descent curves um, showing test error going down when making a model very large were obtained meanwhile, not only for large deep neural nets, but also for plethora of different, also classical machine learning approaches like kernel machines, decision trees, ensemble methods. Here though, an example with um, a deep neural net, uh, ResNet 18 trained on Sci-Fi 10, where increasing model size by increasing the width and the network leads to the test error going further and further down. Um, while training error, as shown here on the right, also um, saturates at zero and doesn't show any further sign of change as opposed to ongoing changes in the test error. This revised view um, on large models being good for generalization was not really surprising for deep learning on image data, as this is what was already usually observed when training large uh, deep neural nets in community. So here, a rather, rather older standard example with ResNets and DenseNets, where increasing in model size uh, and uh, compute during training um, clearly also leads to improvement on top one classification test error on standard ImageNet uh, 1K. Beyond improving generalization on test set, there is also evidence obtained for image domain that Larger models pre-trained on larger source data also improve transfer to different uh, uh, target data sets as shown here by this work known as big transfer. So plots here show experiments where network models of different size um, indicated by circles uh, were pre-trained on uh, data sets of different size uh, here along uh, X axis being standard ImageNet 1K the larger ImageNet 21K and the very large GFT uh, 300. 
and then transferred on different uh, target data sets um, being again ImageNet 1K, Oxford Pets and Cypher 100 by fine tuning pre-trained models and measuring accuracy performance on the targets. So what can be uh, seen here is that while comparatively modest sized models like ResNet do not show consistent improvement on transfer when increasing uh, data uh, set size during pre-training, the two largest tested networks consistently become better and better in transferring when increasing uh, the uh, data size in the pre-training. So for larger models, also transfer performance goes up if you feed them with more and more data during pre-training, while smaller models do not show this consistent uh, transfer improvement. And this kind of pattern um, was also observed in uh, different further works like this one here that again, uh, uh, compares a different, um, well, transfer across different target data sets after pre-training with different size networks um, ordered here on the x-axis uh, uh, from small to large on ImageNet 1K or 21K with consistent outcome showing that increasing either data set size or model size during pre-training improves transfer performance on the target. Um, there is also evidence that few shot transfer learning um, is strongly improved um, when model and data size during pre-training are increased. Improvement being especially pronounced when both model um, and uh, uh, data size increase uh, hand in hand. As for instance shown here, pre-training on a smaller um, ImageNet 1K uh, indicated in green may not consistently improve few shot transfer when increasing the model size um, on X axis. But if source data set for pre-training is large like GFT here in red, uh, then growing model always helps to further um, improve performance on transfer. So same another way around, taking a small model uh, like ResNet 50 um, for pre-training will not provide benefits um, if growing data set size, uh, but taking a large model um, results in transfer improvements when increasing size of pre-training data clearly. So this has strong resemblance with what we saw from scaling loss for language modeling where generalization and transfer took benefit from larger model and larger data sizes used during pre-training. One important uh, remark here is that it is essential to train long enough when increasing model and data set uh, size as spending too short time for training may actually create the impression um, that models pre-trained on larger data are worse on transfer um, than those pre-trained with smaller data. As indicated here on the left upper plot, um, the difference between a smaller red circle um, and the larger blue one standing for models pre-trained with either ImageNet 1K or 21K. So only if you tr train long enough, uh, you indeed get to see the transfer improvements also shown in the table below. And in the case here, even after training, uh, for as long as eight single GPU weeks with a large network, improvements may still not be visible yet. So this makes training experiments like those uh, very compute intensive and also uncertain. So one full training run with a large model on ImageNet 21K, for instance, uh, requires still around 81 hours, even if using large amount of 256 GPUs for pre-training. So until now, um, we saw results based on uh, supervised uh, forms uh, in pre-training and a large fraction of deep learning in image domain is still done in supervised way using data with labels. So most transfer learning studies are also dealing rather with supervised learning. However, this is uh, changing rapidly since some time uh, and uh, different types of unsupervised learning are used um, for training on large amounts of unlabeled image data, creating, for instance, generative models that can produce uh, very realistic image samples from underlying data distribution. So these are actually generated samples here, um, indicating that representations that they learn may be also very useful for transfer. Many of those methods are termed self-supervised because in their laws they define kind of um, auxiliary tasks that work with something that might be called pseudo labels during training. Um, so such methods as generative adversarial networks or variational autoencoders or hybrid of those or non-generative models that use contrastive losses are all rely on doing learning by creating pseudo labels from available data in some automatic generic, um, generic way, uh, mostly independent of the nature of particular data set the training is done on. 
And here the strong hope is that uh, the representations created by those models can be useful for transferring a broad range of downstream tasks um, and have even more generic character than those uh, from models pre-trained in a supervised way. So one example can be using a generative model like a big began uh, depicted here um, that contains an encoder part, which can be used after unsupervised training as a pre-trained model for transfer learning downstream. Another example is taking base encoder uh, F from a non-generative network model that pre-trains by self-supervised learning with contrastive flaws. Um, and uh, this method is quite often used in transfer. So we have a closer look um, on that and following. And the particular work uh, called uh, SimClear, we can do training without labels on any image data set by using a loss uh, for image pairs that is minimized when two transformed uh, versions of the same image get assigned high similarity, uh, while two transformed versions um, of different images get assigned low similarity in a pair. Similarity measure in this case um, can be just simple cosine similarity measure. So network takes pairs of transformed images, um, um, uses base encoder F to uh, generate um, representations H that are mapped further by projection hat G to vector um, uh, to feature vector Z and similarities are computed then based on those and enter the cross entropy loss. So a simple scheme um, that turned out to be powerful in creating generic representations in self-supervised manner. So after training, we can take a uh, base encoder F and use it as a pre-trained model for further fine tuning and transfer. This is what was exercised in the work by Jeanne et al, Sinclair work again, um, where after self-supervised pre-training with contrastive laws without labels, the pre-trained uh, model was fine-tuned on ImageNet 1K in supervised way using only linear classifier on the top um, of the convolutional base encoder. And also here evidence was found um, shown on the right that uh, performance on target task improves uh, when increasing the model size during unsupervised pre-training. And also here in self-supervised pre-training, there is again evidence that increasing model size improves performance, especially when looking in low uh, data transfer regime. So when using different fractions of labels, here taking 1%, 10% uh, uh, of all labels available during fine tuning on ImageNet 1K, the larger the pre-trained model size, the larger we see the improvement, especially when using a uh, very small fraction of labels when compared to standard supervised uh, training uh, from scratch. So, and again, to conduct such pre-training experiments, um, uh, computational demand is very high. For a single pre-training of this kind, you need um, 128 of last generation specialized TPUs running for 1.5 hours if uh, taking just the smallest ResNet uh, 50 as a backbone for pre-training. Um, and this computational cost can be though even much higher for other unsupervised methods used for transfer, like uh, for instance, the self-training approach taking in the recent work by Xi et al. Uh, so there uh, you have a teacher network, um, first pre-trained and supervised man on ImageNet 1K and teacher network um, is used to generate pseudo labels on much larger unlabeled data set like GFT or YFCC 100. And those pseudo labels are taken then to train a new larger student network on the combined data. And this distillation procedure is iterated again and again. Uh, so the resulting large pre-trained model can be then reused for transfer with performance uh, shown here for fine tuning on ImageNet 1K again. So in here, just for single pre-training using a large model on very large GFT data set, you need six days using the incredible number of uh, 2048 TPUs. All right, so. Um, so it seems that increasing model and data set size during pre-training shows transfer improvement. However, most of the studies again look at transfer between similar domains um, that contain natural images mostly. Um, question arises then, uh, would we find hints for similar kind of scaling laws if we were to perform transfer on domains uh, less similar to pre-trained source? Um, Again, a specific scenario of source being natural images and a target being medical images is of high practical interest and some 
Very recent studies uh, make first attempts to look on it on large scale, like the work here by Mustafa et al. from Google Health Lab. Um, they use procedures and networks uh, models from big transfer paper we saw before. So I pre-trained different sized ResNets on ImageNet 1K, ImageNet 21K, and GFT, and look at transfer performance on three medical uh, target sets coming from uh, mammography, um, uh, dermatology, and um, X-ray chest imaging. So again, Chexpert. Uh, for transfer experiments, the outcome seems to indicate that uh, taking a larger model and larger data set um, size for pre-training again somewhat improves transfer performance across all the sets, especially when comparing the smallest uh, and largest sizes, the improvement is clearly there and transfer always outperforms training from scratch using standard ResNet 50 uh, as a baseline indicated by the dashed line. Here, however, the difference in performance shown across uh, pre-training conditions is sometimes rather small. So if you look here on uh, the result in the uh, mammography comparing smallest network uh, pre-trained and smallest data and largest network pre-trained on largest data, much larger. So it's hardly a 0.5% uh, apart. Um, so it's not so clearly pronounced as in case of intra-domain transfer we had before. Also, zero-shot transfer was examined in the setting. A pre-trained network is not allowed to fine-tune at all on the targets. And here, pre-training with larger models and larger data also hints some benefits and some cases improvement strong, like here on the chest uh, X-ray transfer where and when comparing in, for instance, small ResNet 50 with the largest network. Um, and in some cases, like again, in mammography, it's rather small when, for instance, here, yeah, data set size in, is increased uh, for the largest network. Uh, there is hardly a benefit. Transfer performance was also assessed here in terms of data efficiency, measuring what fraction of available data is uh, needed to reach a certain performance level. And we see that in most cases, uh, there is a trend to use less data for transfer if pre-training with a uh, larger model um, on larger data with some inconsistencies in between. So while there is some evidence again showing up that large models and large data lead to transfer improvement, uh, it is less so clearly pronounced uh, as for the intra-domain transfer cases we had before. So from all these studies, uh, it becomes clear that there is a certain lack of systematic approach to test transfer learning uh, in the same manner how it was demonstrated for language modeling and scaling law cases we saw, namely by varying model size, data size, um, compute time for training, and eventually also by controlling other relevant factors like alignment between the source and target domain, uh, testing influence of different learning forms, of different data regimes being low or high during transfer, amount of fine tuning applied. And so all of this calls for a frame to systematically study transfer performance in its dependence on pre-training and fine tuning conditions. This then may allow us to create such insightful plots we saw before from language uh, modeling community that would provide hints on how generalization behaves dependent, uh, for instance, on model uh, and data size are used during pre-training, um, and whether the improvements seen for generalization also appear then in different transfer um, scenarios, eventually leading to a uh, postulation of scaling laws for generalization and transfer that are valid for image domain. So as one modest step in this direction uh, of starting large-scale uh, transfer learning systematically, we framed the so-called COVID-NetX initiative in frame of which we also met together, me and Ralph, um, where we'd like to study all those effects of varying model data size and other factors I mentioned before on transfer performance in a specific frame given by a real world problem of, detected, of detecting uh, COVID-19 relevant patterns and possibly predicting vital patient states from conventional X-ray chest images. Um, so here, uh, pre-training is meant to be done on large source data being either natural or uh, X-ray medical images or combinations of both, uh, while varying model network and data set size type of learning during pre-training and network architectures. And transfer is attempted on different um, uh, target data sets that can be also natural or medical imaging sets of smaller size where one particular data set termed COVID-X uh, contains uh, 
X-ray chest images of COVID-19 uh, patients to probe transfer learning also there. So COVID-X um, is openly available data set that has around um, 2,300 X-ray images of COVID-19 positive patients. It is composed by the efforts of Canadian-based labs from Montreal and Waterloo from different uh, sources across different facilities. And so the idea is that in pre-training, we can go quite large scale on natural image data sets uh, using ImageNet 21K and larger ones like uh, YFCC 100 that can be also used for self-supervised pre-training. Um, and we can introduce systematic gradual variations in data set size by choosing just subsets of those to carefully study um, influence of data set size variation on transfer performance. So other obvious uh, targets for transfer are larger X-ray chest data sets like Chexpert um, or uh, Mimic CXR that contain different non-COVID related pneumonia cases. Um, and these data sets can be also used during a pre-training alone or in combination with large natural image data to study impact uh, on intra or interdomain uh, transfer in such a setting. So current status of the COVID NetX initiative is that uh, it is in its ramping up phase um, after being initiated at GSC back in April 2020 by myself from cross-sectional team deep learning and by Medi Charity from Helmholtz AI, a high level support team. Uh, we intended this to become a frame for studying uh, the kind of large scale transfer learning uh, where pre-training large models on large data is required and hope uh, that insights we win from those experiments uh, will be also relevant for using transfer learning on other pathologies with more clinical uh, relevance indeed. So um, also preparing grounds for quickly adaptable diagnostic aid tools in case of future pandemic events with yet unknown uh, pathogens. So um, we hope to get collaborators on this track from different disciplines and uh, to make it happen even easier, uh, we created a kind of a spin-off challenge uh, hosted on Yulish uh, Data Challenges platform which is a collaborative uh, data science platform driven by Research Center Ulich and local Helmholtz AI uh, that also sets up hackathons. Um, first one we already had this spring. And the hope uh, is that besides attracting people, uh, this challenge will foster a reproducible, easily extendable code base for performing such experiments, um, ensuring better collaboration and encouraging further development. Um, as hinted many, many times uh, during the talk, especially the large scale um, pre-training procedure is computationally very demanding and therefore we have no way but to make use of distributed training on supercomputers to speed up experiment cycles for such studies. And luckily we do have this new machine at hand at JC that is a supercomputer called Jewel's Booster tailored for large scale deep learning and uh, equipped with a fair amount of uh, about 3,700 of A100's NVIDIA GPUs, which made this machine being number one in Europe in November 2020, uh, where it was actually installed. Um, so we got compute time of 1.9 million core hours granted for the first phase of the initiative by Gauss Supercomputing Center organization and plan extension soon in August, uh, where collaborators are very welcome to join in. Uh, just talk to us timely if there is um, interest. So using this kind of machines um, allows us to do computationally intensive uh, uh, model pre-training across a large number of GPUs. And we indeed obtain very good scaling when doing distributed training um, shown here uh, in images uh, per second throughput. And uh, here as a scaling efficiency compared to ideal uh, linear scaling, which gives us close to linear speed up for training uh, to accuracy time and enables to run such experiments in somewhat reasonable time frame. So uh, this number of uh, 81 hours when using 256 GPUs indeed corresponds to what we have measured uh, for average uh, full training run on ImageNet 21K with a large big transfer ResNet 152 times four in width on Jewel's booster. So with uh, one single GPU, uh, one would require roughly 2.4 years to finish such a training run. Um, so being able to run large scale pre-training in reasonable amount of time uh, is necessary. Uh, so there is substantially less than months or weeks or years required otherwise with smaller machines. 
um, we were able then to obtain first preliminary results replicating transfer behavior after a large model, large data pre-training, where we used um, large ResNets from big transfer work pre-trained on either ImageNet um, 1K or 21K. And we see indeed that larger data, ImageNet 21K here in blue, uh, improves transfer across uh, different target data sets. And interestingly, again, the improvement is especially strongly pronounced um, on few shot transfer regime where only few examples, uh, like just one or five here, are shown per class during fine tuning on transfer. So this all is still, of course, very far from the kind of uh, one model uh, for all construct I mentioned earlier. Uh, that just continually digests any incoming tasks and data sets, uh, solving those as they come, um, learning from them, um, and ever further improving the generic model in open-end learning fashion. Uh, but it allows to prepare the steps um, by looking on how transfer in this more simpler setting actually depends on model and data properties and on type of losses used during training, uh, what conditions may help uh, and what may rather hurt transfer. So I would like to uh, summarize with stating that um, the special use case of transfer learning applied to pattern detection in X-ray chest imaging domain is not uh, only dealing with the current real world problem, but is also well suited to actually study properties of large scale transfer learning in general. For instance, an attempt to derive the scaling laws um, showing dependency of transfer performance on model size, data size, and uh, forms of learning used during pre-training. Uh, this scenario also makes possible to study transfer for different types of tasks, classification, segmentation, and we saw that not only supervised pre-training uh, is possible there, but also more interestingly different unsupervised modes that do not require labels. Um, another interesting direction in this frame is given by existence of different uh, medical imaging modalities, so not only conventional 2D X-ray, but also 3D CT and uh, ultrasound data sets that are publicly available. Although their size uh, yeah, is still very, very modest, it already opens uh, perspectives uh, towards multimodal learning and may allow to compare more systematically um, than the differences in intra and inter-domain transfer. Um, a further perspective uh, I would like to mention is establishing this kind of a golden repository where validated models uh, obtained by large-scale pre-training are made openly available to allow for further reuse, validation, and boosting reproducible research in this area. So in this sense, again, everybody who is interested to collaborate on any of those directions, please feel welcome uh, to reach out and join in also for the upcoming compute time application on uh, Jewel's Booster Supercomputer. So here I would like to finish and thank the people that are involved in this line of work. Also, most my colleague, Mehdi Charity, who is main collaborator on COVID-NetX, doing large scale transfer learning experiments I was describing here. He's also main developer and maintainer of Ulich Data Challenges platform where COVIDnetX also offers a challenge to participate on among others. Um, a big gratitude to Alex Struber for making super computers are working uh, good enough for us to run those experiments at all. Uh, to Helmut's AI consultant team at our place that offers a different kind of support here and there and to GSC Supercomputing uh, Facility, together with Dow Supercomputing Center for making all those machines available. And of course, a thank goes uh, to the audience uh, for the attention, last but not least. Thanks a lot uh, for being here, and I'm uh, looking forward to um, any questions and comments uh, to come from your side. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much for your talk, for giving us insight in how you improve transfer learning we are large scale model pre training. So, and before we start the questions and answers section, I will announce that we have Erin Medivan from the Helmholtz AI consultant team, and they will advertise their roadshow on 10th of June. And this will be after the question and answer section. So, now there are some questions in the chat, and I will moderate them for you. So, the first was asked by Jens Petersen, what's your opinion on mixture of experts for vision? Could sometime, something like a switch transformer work for vision models, particularly in a way that new data can be integrated via new experts and only routing 
needs to be tuned? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, in general, transformers, of course, are, um, are, are architectures that are coming strongly in Envision. And uh, particularly, so in the mixture of expert settings, this uh, routing that is already intrinsically there in transformers is very suitable to uh, mediate between the different uh, subnetworks that play the role of experts, switching between the tasks, between the domains. I think this is a very fruitful area. Uh, we should uh, definitely have a look on that. Although the computational demand is further increasing, of course. So the uh, switch transformers, I think, are, are on the um, range of a trillion of parameters even. So for that, you definitely need to go to a larger machine to conduct experiments like this. Thank you for this answer. So the next question asks, can transfer learning be performed on 3D segmentation tasks? And if that is the case, which data set can be used for pre-training in this scenario? Mm. Yeah, that's a very good question because it mentions explicitly 3D, which is not so easily available as a large data set for pre-training. If it would be for 2D, I would immediately say, well, we take uh, generic data sets uh, for 2D segmentation that are really large by now um, and try to get some uh, benefit from pre-training there. For 3D, honestly, I'm not aware of any data set that is large enough to serve as a pre-training base. Uh, maybe somebody else has a hint. Um, so, I mean, there are upcoming models like um, NERF, which deal with volumetric rendering that provide, could provide a lot of ground truth in 3D space on the object boundaries, on the object structure in general. Of course, you could try to work with synthetic data that provides you a true 3D uh, space and segmentations in it and do something like a domain adaptation afterwards uh, and hoping that you get a sim to real transfer. That is possible, but natural data sets uh, that are taking in real environment uh, dealing with 3D, I'm not aware of. Okay, thank you very much. So the next question comes from Abdul Muit. He asked, regarding double descent, why does the test loss not decrease monotonically when increasing model or data size? Is there some theoretical justification for this? Mm. Hold on, maybe I'm trying to go to the slide where we where I have this. Um, so let me check here. Did I find it? Should be here. Okay, can you see this? Okay, so the question is, why the test loss does not decrease monotonically. I mean, here in this study by Belkin in uh, 2019, they were dealing mostly with model size. They were not looking on uh, data size. And what they see here, if you increase model size monotonically to a very, very large uh, model, then you indeed observe a monotonic decrease of uh, test loss. So this is also then shown here uh, on a, a specific example, which is though a bit of a toy example, when I have to say with a ResNet 18, that is actually a small model. Um, so, but you see the monotonic decrease with uh, increasing the model size, and it actually decreases stronger than the so-called sweet spot uh, state in the uh, classical underparameterized regime. So you go way beyond the generalization capability in the classical regime. With data size, this kind of uh, double descent or triple or whatever descent curves has to be yet obtained properly. Um, maybe there will be a, a similar or a different picture, but for the model size increase, there is this kind of monotonic uh, decrease then uh, observed. So maybe I haven't understood the question then properly. Maybe you can exchange afterwards. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So the next question comes from Patrick Godot. He says, first, thank you for the nice talk. And then you mentioned the vision of a continual learning model. What are your expectations on this in the near future? And despite of brute force, any combination of pre-training, fine-tuning, and the general rule, bigger is better, what strategy do you know of for choosing ideal transfer scenarios? Well, I mean, there are a lot of... Um, uh works that go into direction of uh, bi-level optimization that I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk, 
where you have meta-learning approaches, so at least two different loops, the inner and the outer loop, where from the beginning you try to optimize um, your model for the scenario of the unseen data. So it, in this sense, it learns to learn. So you really uh, impose changes on the core learning algorithm during the training. Um, I think this is one very fruitful direction, although computationally very, very expensive. Um, but then again, you know, um, so further take on this is people were also convinced that in vision you can solve the problems before 2006 or so, uh, only by constructing very clever specialized architectures that use something uh, very magical. Uh, it turned out then that if you just increase the scale uh, of the model of the uh, data, uh, then all of a sudden things begin to work. And I mean, uh, there is a view advocated by, uh, for example, Richard Sutton, who says that this is the lecture we have to learn. So first you have to increase the scale to invest compute and see whether you indeed cannot solve the problem um, before going to very like intricate architectures and trying uh, uh, ideas in that direction. So I think we should do uh, also these experiments with scaling up and see what happens, whether all of a sudden multitasking and multi-domain and like meta-learning just emerges from a huge capacity of the network. Like the vision, the object recognition capabilities emerged from uh, increasing the data and the network size in the vision domain. Mm. Thanks for this answer. So then we have a last question from Olaf Zimmermann. He asked, what insights and evidences exist regarding the type of abstraction that is happening in the interpolation regime? And he's meant second valley. So let me switch to the, to the valley. So what insights exist? What happens when the, uh, the arrow begins uh, to drop? Okay, so I think here one can refer to this uh, work by um, Belkin et al. Um, in uh, proceedings of National Academy of Science, they try to argue uh, that what hap that what happens beyond the interpolation threshold is some sort of uh, automated model selection. So that the huge capacity of the network allows it actually to contain a lot of simple Occam's razor compatible models that are switched based on the uh, current task, task affordance. Um, so you incorporate an ensemble of such in one big network and therefore you still follow Occam's razor just simply uh, uh, depending on the context you are on. Um, this is the explanation uh, I'm aware of and uh, there are there is a pile of work now following this double descent curve behavior appearing in NeurIPS and iClear and uh, people are trying to find their uh, more solid I think theoretical uh, um, foundations why this is happening. But uh, to my knowledge the most uh, um, the most evidence obtained is still um, experimental. So there is no very clear explanation why this is the case so far. So thanks again. <laughs> thanks for the questions. I was hoping that somebody would ask about what is in the last picture. By, uh, nobody, <laughs> nobody did. <laughs> Do you want to explain? Well, yeah, I mean, explaining is a big word. It was just a Domatinian dog. Um, and I mean, um, I'm pretty sure that our current vision networks are large enough could even identify it, uh, although the uh, scene is completely highly ambiguous. But who knows, actually, one should try. Great. And again, thank you very much, Dinja, for, for being today and being our speaker today. And yeah, if there are further questions, please visit our website. There are all the contact details. And um, yeah, for, for any question regarding the seminar, please come back to me. So thank you very much, everybody. And we'll see us in two weeks for the next data science seminar. And um, be aware to be there on 10th of June for the Helmholtz AI Roadshow. So thank you again. Goodbye and stay healthy, everyone. Thanks a lot for inviting me again. Thanks for attending. Bye-bye, folks.